tonight, I would like for you to turn with me um, to the book of 2 Peter, and in chapter number 1, 2 Peter, chapter number 1. I want to um, I want to talk to you tonight. I, I just see the importance, um, even how I spoke last week on maturing and in growing um, in the things of God. And so tonight I want to talk to you about growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to find this this scripture here in Second Peter chapter one. I'm going to be reading verses one through eleven, and then from there we're going to kind of dissect um, this scripture here. And um, because I just really believe um, that in the kingdom of God in general, as a whole, um, that there's not enough growth that's, that, that takes place. And so I believe that you know we, we have to get an understanding of what Christ has called us for. What is our what is our purpose? What is our responsibility? Um, and we can find that written here in the words of Scripture. So growing in the knowledge. Of Jesus Christ. I'm going to begin reading here on chapter 1, verse number 1. <clears throat> Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse number 5. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election for sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so as an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I want to jump to the end. Chapter number 3. 2 Peter, chapter number 3. Going towards the end of that. Um, Chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse number 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, um, for the power of your word that is capable of bringing transformation to even the hardest of hearts, God, to even the proudest of men and women, God, to even those, Lord, that, that, that lay in stubbornness, God, and, and don't want to be moved, Lord. We thank you for your word, because the power of your word breaks through all those things, God, and you challenge us, and you call us, Father, to, to a higher calling, Lord. And so, Father, we pray that tonight that your word would go forth with power, with authority, God, and that the challenge would be placed tonight, Lord, 
and that we would hear with our spiritual ears and we would respond to the challenge of the Holy Spirit. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I went here to the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, that is the title of the message, and that is where the Apostle Peter actually ends his second letter or his second epistle. Okay? And so as we look at, at, at Peter, and we understand if you read through the book of 2 Peter, you're going to hear some language that Peter is using. And in his language, he's pretty much talking about his time is at hand, that pretty soon he will no longer be, he uses the term tent, talking about his body, that he will no longer be here on earth. And so, as we look at this letter that he is writing, um, he is writing it to the Christian community. And something that he is emphasizing here, even as he opens up in the book of Second Peter, and he talks about growing in the knowledge of Christ Jesus, and we see how he actually ends his letter, his conclusion. He finalizes his letter by saying, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk to you tonight about developing a Christ-like character in your life. Developing a Christ-like character in your life. When it's talking about knowledge, it's not only talking about having an intellectual knowledge of who Christ is, but it's talking about having and taking on the character of Jesus Christ. So let's look here at what this scripture is telling us or what it is teaching us. What does it mean to grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus? I want to go to where we opened up here tonight. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Okay? What does it mean to, to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? It means, according to the epistle of Peter, to develop these particular eight graces that we find here written in the Word of God. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, kindness, brotherly kindness, and love. There are some particular graces that need to be developed in our life according to to the Apostle Peter, if we are going to grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. I'm going to close this because it's interfering with me. I hear noises back there. These graces are listed as we just read. The first one that it talks about, it talks about faith. We already know what faith is. Faith is something that has to be developed in our life. It is a grace that has been given onto us. And it goes on to talk about virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is moral excellence or having goodness in your life. These are things that we need to obtain if we are going to grow in the knowledge of who Christ Jesus is. It goes on to say knowledge. What is knowledge? It is having the correct insight. It continues with self-control or self-discipline, having a discipline in our lives or in ourselves, having perseverance, bearing up or standing firm under trials, right? Perseverance, that, that we are capable of persevering when, when, when hardships come your way, that you don't suddenly disappear from church and we can't find you anymore. But perseverance says, Regardless, we sing that last song, It is well with my soul. And I don't know if you know where that song comes from, but it comes from a man who wrote this hymn. And at the time, I believe he had lost his wife and he had lost his daughters. And, and, and they were they, he had lost them at sea, I believe. And so this is a man who writes a hymn that regardless, the lot that you've given me in my life, although hardship 
has come to me. He is a man that persevered. And that is what God has called you and I to do. That in the midst of trial, in the midst of hardship. See, many people, they don't persevere. The minute, the moment that, that trials or tribulations come their way, now they're willing to stand okay when they're small trials. But when the heavy trials of life come... They, they, they separate, they isolate themselves, they run away from the kingdom. Perseverance goes on to say godliness or having godly character or out of a devotion to the Lord. Do we have that godly character tonight? Talks about brotherly kindness or having a love toward the brethren, right? Having love for one another. And then it goes on, and it just says love in general, which definitely means just actively having goodwill towards others, not necessarily those that are of the faith. And so sometimes we find um, that it's easier to love those within the kingdom um, than it is to love those that are in the world. And see, we've been called to love those that are in the world as well, to not love the world, not love the things of the world, but the people that are in the world, we've been called to love them as well. And so a lot of times we're okay with being kind to those brethren, to those that are in the kingdom, but sometimes we're not willing to extend that same grace to the people that may not be a part of the kingdom. And so the Apostle Peter is writing here, and he's talking about a particular eight graces that one man or woman must have in their life if we are going to develop a growing knowledge of Christ Jesus in our life. In chapter 1, verse 8, it tells us that. It says, For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a particular instruction that the Apostle Peter is writing to the church or writing to you and I tonight. And so like I said, it's more than having an intellectual knowledge of who Christ is. But if you actually study this, this first chapter in 2 Peter, you understand that he's talking about a knowledge that is beyond head knowledge. It's talking about knowing Christ or knowing God in an intimate way, in a way that is thoroughly acquainted with who He is, to accurately know well Jesus Christ. And if you continue to look at this scripture, it's talking about, uh, when you study the scripture and it's talking about adding, right? It says, and you add to your faith virtue and add to this, and add to that. The actual word that is used in its original language, it's talking about like a choir coming together. It's talking about all the pieces of a choir coming together, each grace working in harmony with the other one to produce an overall effect. So what Peter is saying is he's saying, you can't just cherry pick one or two of these virtues. All of them together, all of them collectively operating and functioning in your life will bring forth that growth of the knowledge of Christ in your life. So you can't just say that I can do this one and I can do this one, but I can't do that one. When you study the scripture and you understand what it's saying, it is saying all of these pieces, when they come together in your life, that what will it will produce out of you will be the knowledge of who Christ Jesus is. You will have have that understanding and you will walk with that knowledge and grace of who Christ is. Amen. It's in conjunction with each other. And add to this that. Study that. Study, study that scripture. Look at the understanding of what the apostle Peter is writing to the church. And the importance of of the study of Scripture. 
You, you, you can't just read scripture and just look at it at just the surface. There, there is so much more depth to the Word of God. And if we are going to unlock the truth of God's Word, then we got to get in and study it and understand what it's saying. we got to understand that we can't just pick a few things that we want to walk in. And that if we lack and if we fail in some areas, then we would say, God, I need your help. God, I need you to help me in this area in my life because I'm failing. And I want to walk in the fullness of the knowledge of Him, of Christ Jesus in my life. He goes on to say in chapter 1, verse 5, and in verse 10, to do it with all diligence. He repeats it, not once, but two times. He says it for a second time. It means with an earnestness, a zeal, to grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. It is going to require effort. It is going to require effort. Listen, growing in God doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens intentionally. It doesn't happen naturally. See, growing in Christ isn't going to just naturally happen in your life. You have to be intentional. you got to lock in with laser focus. If you are going to grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus, you're not just going to go to church and it's just going to all of a sudden naturally begin to happen because you hear sermon after sermon after sermon. You have to bring application to it. You have to intentionally do things in your life to position you to grow in that way. And a lot of people are thinking that it's just going to naturally happen. I'm just going to become a Christian and naturally this is what's going to take place. No, naturally what's going to happen is you're going to sit in a seat and over a period of time you are going to, to grow lukewarm to the things of God and naturally you are going to begin to allow various compromise into your life. This is what is going to naturally happen if you just come to church and you allow life to just take its course and you don't pinpoint with a laser your focus and intentionally prepare yourself to say, God, I want more of you. God, I'm pursuing more yeah. of you. Naturally, friend, you are going to fail. Yeah. I am going to fail. If I do not put effort and say, I am intentional about the things of God. Right? When you want something, when you're pursuing something, you are intentional. You will position yourself. You will put yourself at the right place at the right time to obtain what you are intentionally trying to obtain in your life. You will position the right people in your life to say, I am intentionally pursuing that. And if that person is in my life, they are going to get me closer to my goal. Man. Well, see, the kingdom of God is no different. You have to be intentional to grow in the knowledge and grace of who Christ is. Or you're going to be like the Christian that I was talking about last week. Been saved 20 years, but it has the growth of a one-year-old. Grew that entire year and then just tapped out, just stopped right there. And so now here you are, 20 years into salvation but you still have the maturity at the end of that first year. You, your faith hasn't grown. You know, n nothing has grown in you. you. You just remain at that place. And so if you're not intentional, that's what's going to happen. These things don't happen by accident. They don't happen naturally. They happen when men and women are intentional and they say, God, I'm pursuing you. God, I want more. I want to grow in the things of the kingdom. What are reasons for why we want to grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus? Well, according to Scripture here, because grace and peace are then multiplied in our life. Imagine that. 
when we allow ourselves to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, grace and peace are multiplied in our life. And that's why you see some people, and they are walking, and the grace of God has just been multiplied. The peace of God has just been multiplied all over their life. I mean, they just, they, they walk with that peace. And then sometimes we say, man, I want that. Well, why is it that, that they have that? Well, because they understand that you have to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what the Peter opens up with. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's, that's verse number two. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So in, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, may grace and peace be multiplied unto you. You see, all men, whether saved or unsaved, experience a portion of God's favor in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, it talks about that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So there is, there is a, a portion of God's grace that's poured out upon humanity, but there is another portion, an, an extra favor, that is poured upon God's people. See, the rain falls upon the just and the unjust. God allows that to happen. But upon you and I, as born-again believers who are growing in the knowledge of Jesus, He pours out His grace and His peace. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and what? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but I love walking in the peace of God. I love having God's peace. You know what? This may be happening over here, and this may be happening over here. But man, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sitting in the peace of God. I'm basking in His presence, and that's something that you can't get any other way, friend. Amen. But through growing in the knowledge of who yes. Christ Jesus is, by taking on these virtues, these characteristics. That together, collectively, this is what they produce in your life. This is what happens in your life. Then he goes on in verse number 3. And his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. There's that word knowledge. That word knowledge is talking about knowing Him. It's not talking about having an intellectual understanding of who He is. I know our English word, we say knowledge, and right away we think the mind, the knowledge of the mind. Yep. But it's talking about knowing Him in an intimate, in a deeper sense, and in a deeper way. And so are we pursuing that in our lives? Because if we are, then all things pertaining to life and godliness... God is providing to us. Think about that. All things pertaining to life. That's why when, 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 when the Christian is firing on all cylinders, right? It's just so evident. I mean, man, you just see Jesus. You just see peace. You just see joy. You just see excitement, right? And meanwhile, you got the other people that are professing to be believers... And, 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 and it looks like they're sucking on salalitos in the corner, man. With a sour lemon, you know, they look all mad. And then the other ones, man, and they're firing on all cylinders. 
They are walking in the fullness of who Christ is. All things pertaining to life and godliness are provided. All things pertaining to life. What's going on in your life? What's going on in your life? What, what things do you need for God to move upon, for God to pour out His Spirit upon? Life in this context refers to our spiritual life and well-being. Are you growing in the knowledge of who Christ is? Then verse number 9. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. You have a form of spiritual amnesia. You're short-sighted if you are not growing in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. You have no vision. Right? You have no vision. You, you have no vision for the future. You have no vision for the things that God can use you in. All you see is what's happening right now. All you see is what's happening right now. All these distractions. Thank you, babe. I wonder if any of us tonight have spiritual amnesia. What is the ultimate objective of being a Christian tonight? What is our, our purpose? What is the reason? Is it not for you and I to become like Christ? Isn't that the purpose? Isn't, isn't that what the Bible teaches happens to men and women of God? That Christ comes and dwells inside of us. And He changes our heart. And he begins to develop within us a new, founded, godly character that never existed before. We used to operate and work in the flesh. So you and I have been called to become more like Christ. When we fail to do this, it shows that we have forgotten the purpose for which we were redeemed in the first place. Some of us think, oh, it's because, you know, our life was a mess. You know, and that's the only reason why Christ came to die. No, because you made it a mess. Because I made it a mess. Because we made it a mess, you know? In our sinful way. And we think that that's it. You know, God, God just come and fix my problems. <laughs> just come and make me better. And then once I'm better, you know, then thank you, God. I'm, I'm good now. But, but, but the Lord says, I'm not done with you yet. I am developing. I, I saved you. All of that was for a reason. That whole miracle I did, that whole goodness thing I did, that was to get your attention. That was to show you who I am. And I've showed you who I am. And so now, because I've showed you who I am, I want you to commit your life to who I am now. And to allow yourself to develop godly characteristics in your life so that you can become more like me, so that you can be useful for my kingdom, and you can win more people to the kingdom, because you're not going to win people to the kingdom with a bad attitude. Right? You're not going to win people to the kingdom by acting rude to them, by treating them badly. <laughs> hey man, why don't you come to church, man? Jesus loves you. <laughs> you're going to get an argument with people doing things like that. But what are people drawn to? People are drawn to what? The love of God. Above all things, it is the love of God that draws us in. It is that love, that overwhelming, amazing love of God that we never felt any other way in our life. To know that despite what I've done, despite what you've done, that He still loves you. Amen. It's not based on conditions. But it's based on the love of the Father. Yes. All of these things are things that happen in our life. If we allow ourselves to grow 
in the knowledge of Jesus. And we allow ourselves to grow in these graces that collectively work together in our life. Look what else happens. Check this one out. Verse 10. <clears throat> Therefore, brethren, once again, he says, be diligent. Be even more diligent to make your call an election sure. For if you do these things, what does it say? You will not stumble. If you do these things, you will not stumble. Again, if you study the scripture here, it's not talking about you will not sin. Because we're all going to sin at different times in our life. When it's talking about stumble, it's talking about you will not go back to the world. You will not backslide. You will not turn your back on God. If you diligently seek God and desire to grow in the knowledge and in the grace of who He is, and you allow the graces of God to collectively work in your life, and you begin to take on the character of Christ, you begin to operate in what God has called you to do, the Bible says that you will not go back to where you came from. You will not be like what the Bible talks about, a dog returning to his vomit. You know, that's what the Bible talks about, a backslider. When, when, when people go back to the world, the Bible says it's like a dog that threw up and then left, and then later on said, hmm, I think I'm going to go eat that throw up. And walks back over there and eats that throw up that is on the ground. Spiritually, that is what a backslider is doing. You're out there in the world, you're dealing with the hardships and the burning and the pain and the anger and the rejection and the using, people using you and abusing you and mistreating you and taking advantage of you, right? And then all of a sudden, God calls you into his kingdom, man, and he embraces you with love and he surrounds you with the family of God and you're growing in the knowledge and in the grace of who he is. You're walking in his peace, man. You're walking in his joy, man. And you're enjoying the salvation of who he is. Now life may not be perfect, but it sure is a heck of a lot better than it was over there. Yeah. And that you're appreciated, you're used, people love you for who you are, right? And then all of a sudden the devil lies to you, and you're here before the presence of God, and the table of God has been set before you, man. And it's full of ribeye, and prime rib, and filet <laughs> mignon, and lobster, and crab legs, and shrimp cocktail, man. And butter cake and all that good stuff and so God's providing this table right and you're enjoying it for this moment and then all of a sudden the devil lies to you and you say I'm going to go eat that throw up I don't want the, the, the master's table anymore well the Bible says that when you grow in the knowledge of Christ that that don't happen Thank you, Jesus. you won't stumble you won't go back no matter how hard things may get, that you have grown, you have developed in the things of God. That word stumble talks about the loss of salvation. Now you may slip up on board. You may make bad choices and bad mistakes and, you know, do the wrong thing here or there. But it's talking about completely going back to that bad place. Peter clearly says in his letter here, if you do these things, you will never stumble. And so what a, what a wonderful plan. What a wonderful way to look at, at our salvation and to say there, there are some things that I can put in place in my life to assure I don't, I don't go back. And, and, and let me... Let me tell you this tonight. Don't you think for one moment that that can't happen to you? Because let me tell you something. There was a time in my life where I, I would be the first to say that would never happen to me. I would never do any. I would never go back to that. Well, let me tell you how the enemy works. Takes his time. Very slow. 
He's intentional on what he's trying to do. And he will slowly pick you apart, piece by piece. But if we put some safeguards in place, if, if we apply the Word of God. See, my hope is this. When we have a Bible study and, and, and I'm preaching a message, I challenge you that when the message is done, to go and read the chapter for yourself. Let, let, you know, let it be the next, whatever. And, and then, or, or even at church, you know, when, when, when the preaching is done, okay, you, you've heard what the preacher had to say, and what we're saying is true, but then go and take it and, and begin to read it a little bit more. Begin to get it into your spirit. Because I'll tell you, that's a, that's a powerful truth. That if I do these things, that I will never stumble. That would have been very useful for me nine years ago. <laughs> if I would have had some of these things in place. And so this is what the Word of God is teaching us. This assurance is true only if we are giving all diligence to grow in the knowledge of Christ. That's what the Scripture says. See, you've you, you got to understand Scripture. You've got to read Scripture all the way through. You've got to see what it... You can't just... Too many people just, you know, oh, this is my favorite Scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, that's, they pick that one little part out, and man, they think they can do anything. That's not what the Scripture teaches. It means things that God has called you to do, things that are in God's will for you to do, that you can do it. Even though you may feel that you lack the confidence to do it, the Lord is saying, no, I've called you to do it. I've put you in that position. Let me tell you this. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about here tonight. But let me tell you this. That if God has put you in a place to do something, that you are more than capable of doing it. That you may look at it and say, that you, you may not be the, the, the most qualified, but if God puts you in a place or a position or opens an opportunity for you, and you know it's God's will, especially in the kingdom. Sometimes you may lack confidence in yourself, but let me tell you this, go for it. Do it. Step out. You are able. You do your best, you do your part to prepare. You do your, your part, your best to prepare for what God has called you to do. And then you simply say this prayer, God, I have done everything that I'm capable of doing. I have invested myself into this. I can do no more. Holy Spirit, I need you to take over. That's all. That's all I can do, God. An abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom is where Peter ends this with. Not in the book, but in what we're talking about here, in growing in the knowledge of Christ. 1.11 For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate goal. See, we get to, we get to uh, receive all of these blessings while we're here on earth, right? And then the final blessing is what I shared with you right now. If we grow in the knowledge of Christ, if, if that will allow us to remain stable and never stumble and never go back to the things we came out of, guess what? We make it. We achieve it. We make it to the end. And the Bible is very clear. And it says that in the last days that even the very elect will fall away from the things of God. And so I'm here to tell you that the cards may be stacked against you. And so, you got to do something about it. We, I have to do something about it. We have to allow ourselves to grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. There's a reason why. These past two weeks, we've been discussing these things. Remember Pastor Raymond said each Bible study, they're going to be led in whatever direction the Bible study needs to be taught or spoken to. And so there's no doubt in my heart and in my mind that what, what the, the table that God is preparing for us to spiritually partake of, the, the, the meat that God is providing for us, that God is speaking, that God is speaking. And you need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
And you need to say, God, what are you saying to me? What is it that you want me to do? What is it that you've called me to do? So as we close here tonight, these particular graces that Peter has called us to, I challenge you. You know how we call it Bible study, but we don't really study the Bible together? It's more of a preaching, right? Like a church service. So here's your study lessons. There's your study. Go home and look at those eight particular graces that Peter's talking about. Look at them for yourself. And, and, and look and say to yourself, where am I strong within these things? And where am I weak within these things? And the things that you're weak on, find a way to strengthen them. Now, be prepared for this. When you pray for something... The only way you're going to grow through it is to walk through the opposition. So the only way you're going to grow in the love of the brethren is for the brethren to get you upset, and then you have to grow through that. Otherwise, you, you know, you'll never grow through it. God, give me more love for the brothers. It's not going to just happen all of a sudden. No, things are going to happen that may upset you, but through... The Holy Spirit, God's going to allow you to overcome that. And when you overcome that, you're going to realize, okay, I just grew through that. I'm not looking at things the same way. And, and you, you take any one of those eight things that Peter's talking about. Now, this isn't some particular formula, you know what I mean? Some Christian formula that you're going to put this together. But the Apostle Peter is saying these particular eight graces, look at them. And say, God, how can, where I'm lacking, how can, how can, you help me in this area. And when you pray that prayer, remember earlier I was talking about some of us, we just want to sit back and do nothing because to step into the will of the Father, it's going to require much of you. It's going to require sacrifice. And sacrifice isn't always time. Sacrifice is sometimes your character. Sacrifice is sometimes your attitude. Sacrifice is sometimes requiring you to step out and do something that you really don't want to do. God, I really don't feel like that. that, that that's, that's rubbing me the wrong way. Sacrifice is going to push you into that. And so my challenge to you tonight as we close is to look at those things and say, God, where, where am I strong and where am I lacking? And where I'm lacking, God, help me in those areas. And when you pray that prayer, be prepared for something to challenge you in that area. It's like this. When you pray for patience, right? And that's okay to pray for patience. You know, it, it's, it's a godly virtue. But when you pray for patience... Just be prepared for some things to start getting on your nerves because the only way that you are going to grow in the area of having patience is for things to start to conflict with you. Oh, yeah, start giving you. Oh, man, that's right. I pray for this. <laughs> the only way you grow, and I really am closing with this because it's 9 o'clock now. Mm. The only way, no, I know, I close a lot. Mm. The only <laughs> way you grow, the only way you grow is through opposition. Physically and spiritually, right? When, when when a man's lifting weights, how does he get how does he get big and buff, right? Through opposition, that weight, that resistance, that resistance is what brings growth. So it is in spiritual matters. But I tell you, man, pray the prayer, pray the hard thing, because you will be grateful when you're on the other side and you look back at your past, you look back at history, you look back at the hard things that you've been through. And you say, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I hadn't experienced them struggles in life. Amen. So praise God for the struggles and for the hard things. Amen? Yes. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Yes. Developing a Christ-like character. Let's continue to grow, my friends, in the things of God. Let's continue and do wonderful things for the kingdom soul winning, restoring, laying hands, people being healed, just doing the kingdom, man, building relationships, building one another, just living the kingdom. No place we'd rather be. As we close tonight, I'm going to lead anybody in a prayer tonight that possibly may want to commit their life to the Lord. Um, maybe you're, you're watching us tonight, I don't know, I just have to give this opportunity all the time. 
And so um, if Jesus Christ isn't Lord of your life, I'm just going to um, I'm going to say a prayer. If you want to make him Lord of your life, just simply repeat this prayer with me tonight. And just say, Heavenly Father, I come before you tonight. And I recognize tonight, Lord, that I am a sinner and I am in desperate need of a Savior. And so, Father, I ask you tonight that you would come into my life, um, that you would live inside me, that you would dwell inside me, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Uh, because I believe, I believe in the cross. I believe that you sent your Son, Jesus. I believe he died and I believe that he rose on the third day. And that today he sits at the right hand of you in heaven. And so, Lord, I thank you tonight. I thank you by throwing me that lifeline. I thank you, Lord, for being, being the sacrifice when I wasn't able to. Father, I love you, I thank you, and I bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we close tonight in a word of prayer, friends, um, you know, I'm, my hope tonight is that you're getting this understanding, that, that, that you're getting nudged, that the Holy Spirit is, is tugging on you, man. And he's telling you it's time. <clears throat> Pandemic, it may still be going on. You know, the world may still be in chaos. None of us is denying that it's real, that it's happening, right? We, we all know a lot of people that have lost their lives. We know a lot of people that have been extremely sick. There's no denying that. But we can't focus on that no more. Yes, we need to pray for it. We need to pray for those that are sick. But we got to get busy. we got to get busy for the kingdom. And we got to say, God, what's my assignment? Here I am, Lord. What can I do? How can I help? Right? How can I help? We want, we want to be a part of something. Like when you, when, when, when you see tragedy, when you see something going on, and you come and you show up, man, how can I help? What can I do? What can I do in this situation? That's how you got to be about the kingdom. Well, our family members are dying and going to hell that don't know Jesus Christ. Or our friends that don't know Jesus. Yes, they're dying and they're going to hell. Hell is very real and it exists. Our backslidden children will die and go to hell if they don't repent, if they don't give their lives to Jesus Christ. That's the truth. That's the truth. I got a lot of family members that have died in the past and we went to the funerals and we went there and you know the, the, they're, they're talking about how they're in heaven. No, they're not in heaven. They didn't go to heaven. They were bad people. They weren't repentant in their life. So I say it's time that we say, God, what, what can I do? How can I help? Because when you help somewhere else, you may not be able to reach those that are so close to you because, you know, even the Bible says that Jesus, the prophet in his own town, is without honor. So you may not be effective in, in, in your hometown, in your home, where you're living. But when you help in another man's vineyard, God will sound healthy in your vineyard. And begin to invest in blessings. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you tonight for your holy scriptures. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We just pray that tonight, God, that, that we would be inspired, Father, to lift our hand, to say, what can I do? How can I impact the kingdom? Where, where can I be used? Where can I be placed? Even if it may be in areas that seem to be small or insignificant, there is nothing small or insignificant in the kingdom of God. Your word says, Lord God, that even, even the mustard tree, Lord God, that, that little seed that is planted, yet look at the tree that it produces, that the birds of the air have a place to lodge. And so, Father, we do not despise small beginnings. And so, Lord, we are, we are here to say, Father, whatever it is you've called us to do, just speak to us, Lord. Let us hear your voice, bring forth confirmations, give us dreams, give us visions, give us understanding. Give us understanding, Lord, of what you want us to do in these days and in these times to advance the kingdom of heaven. Father, we love you. Thank you tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name.